So I, I don't often tell people that I dropped a couple of engineering courses in university to take philosophy. But uh, in this environment, I think I can, I can actually say that now. Thanks, thanks to Cheryl. So thank you. Um, so can also continue with the balloon theme. This is the, uh, this is the, the dream of bigger dream. That's, a, that's, that's the theme. It kind of naturally flowed uh, as the theme for this year. And um, when I was talking to Mike about what, sh what should we what should, we, what should we theme this, this show? And after, over the course of four years uh, of doing this event in, across Canada, uh, it became obvious that really where it was coalescing was really about entrepreneurship. Less about medical device commercialization, which was its initial, initial premise, and it's really, it's really found a home as, as entrepreneurship, inspiring entrepreneurs and bringing successful serial med, med tech entrepreneurs from all over North America to tell their stories in Canada. And, uh, delighted that we're kind of finding that spot. So I'm going to start by telling you a few stories. Um, so I don't know if how, how many of you have any idea who this guy is. Chris Hanna, not a household name in Canada. So about 1985, he and three friends in Vancouver got together. And uh, they were very physics-y. And uh, he actually had a PhD in pharmacology. But uh, the other ones were very physics-y. And they decided to. Uh, to, they developed a new technology for imaging, uh, uh, something to do with, with uh, breast cancer. I'm not exactly sure what the technology was. But they called their, their company Advanced Light Imaging. And uh, I guess the only guy who didn't know anything about physics or imaging became the CEO. They are fresh minted uh, C, uh, PhD in pharmacology. And uh, so they, they raised some money. Uh, and uh, and from, a, from a, a friendly investor, um, another fairly famous guy named Wilton Wong, Milton Wong in Vancouver. And uh, they set out trying to sell this thing and uh, didn't have that much luck, actually. People, the, 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 the hospitals were just not that excited about buying their, their breast imager, didn't, didn't actually solve a useful problem for them. But one thing they did uh, find that everybody was very excited about how they actually stored the data. They were the newfangled things, these, these networks of personal computers were just sort of being, and this client server architecture uh, for storing medical data was pretty, pretty new in a hospital at the time. So they got, uh, everybody got excited about that. So within a year, they dropped their whole pretense of medical imaging and just became an ultrasound data storage company. And over the course of the next five years or so, uh, they started, to, they built up to a staff of 15. They went, they raised $5 million from the same investor, all one investor. And they were starting to get a little bit of traction, but they were still, still losing money. And uh, they didn't, uh, didn't really know what to do next. So they brought in a new, uh, new CEO, a fellow named Greg Pete. And he, he, they, they were kind of running out of, out of ability to raise capital. So he immediately launched them onto the Vancouver Stock Exchange, as one did in those days with just about anything that moved. And, uh, and, uh, but they scaled the company to 50 people. And uh, nine years later, they sold it for over $500 million to McKesson. And to this day, one of the largest uh, medical device transactions in Canadian history. And that company ran as McKesson. It, uh, it now has 850 employees uh, in Vancouver. It's one of the anchor tenants of the medical device industry there. And uh, it's recently been spun into a new joint venture called Change Healthcare, uh, which has got operations in 10 or 12 different countries. And, uh, and it's been a great success. And this guy, Chris Hanna, has gone on to uh, start two other large startups in the field, one of them in Wisconsin and one in Minneapolis uh, in, uh, in health informatics. I wish that he started them in Toronto or Vancouver, but, uh, but, if, but uh, he's clearly uh, he diverged, he realized that his, his future was in, in health data. So, next story. Rick Mangott, this is a name you will know a little bit, little bit better perhaps. This guy uh, started, a, he was finishing his PhD around 2000 in Winnipeg and in the Ian Smith lab, at, in, uh, in the NRC lab. And, uh, and they, they came up with some technology for using uh, dyes in blood to be able to track uh, uh, tissue perfusion, basically. And they went after their first application was uh, in uh, basically in skin uh, transplants. And uh, we actually worked with them in shortly after that. And so they had this really interesting technology. They couldn't get enough critical mass in Winnipeg. So they moved the company to uh, Mississauga. And, uh, and then it turned out that there was a, a, a dying public company in Vancouver called uh, Zillix 
that was also in tissue fluorescence. And so they acquired the asset, they bought the company, uh, mostly for a talent, uh, set up R&D in Vancouver, and they launched the product a few years later, and it became very successful. Uh, in fact, we made the first 500 units in our shop in, in Victoria, They're about the size of fridges. So you could imagine a small engineering company at the time trying to make 500 of anything it was uh, it's quite an, a logistical challenge. And, uh, and, and interestingly enough, they then brought in a scaling CEO, uh, similar to the last story, a fellow named Arun Manawat. Some of you would know who that is. And, uh, and they had a distribution deal with a, a, a company uh, called LifeCell and did extremely well. Things just exploded into the market. And so clearly they did a fantastic job identifying the clinical need. Uh, a few years later, they took over uh, their own manufacturing. They took over their own distribution. They expanded into endoscopy, uh, did a deal with uh, um, Intuitive Surgical. And, uh, and, and last year, they, uh, they, they sold the company for a billion dollars uh, to Stryker. That is the largest deal in Canadian med tech history. And, uh, and that company has 200 staff in, in Vancouver again. Uh, so that R&D core is stuck, and they're intending to grow it to 400, according to their latest, uh, latest stories on the street in Vancouver. And uh, so once again, another, another large transaction, another large success. Interesting, the division of uh, Stryker that bought them was Stryker Endoscopy. So it's really, they had no interest in skin transplants or anything like that. It's really only about the endoscopy. So the initial premise of the company was not the thing that led them to, to have all the value in the market, which is exactly like the very first story. I've got two more quick stories for you, and then I'll show you a few numbers. So uh, Steve Arliss, some of you may know this, this fellow. Uh, so in Montreal, a few years back, there was some, uh, some, some engineers, some researchers who came up with the idea that it would be a good idea to put uh, liquid nitrogen inside your heart because that way you could kill off the endothelial cells inside the atrium and you could be a therapy for atrial fibrillation, which is a gigantic market. And every company that's credibly going after atrial fib is worth hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, so uh, they got a certain amount of uh, early uh, encouragement from their clinical work, but they really needed somebody who knew how to how build a commercial company. So they recruited in a guy named Steve Arliss. He had actually been the former uh, uh, president or CEO of Smith & Nephew in North America. Engineer by background, but spent his whole career in sales. And, um, and he actually raised $160 million over the course of three or four rounds. Uh, had some hair-raising adventures, actually halted two clinical trials in the middle of trying to figure out their clinical value proposition, um, and finally exited to Medtronic for $360 million. And, uh, and that division is still there in, in Montreal, and it's a huge success there. And it's, uh, I'm sure it's spawned a few companies, so I'm, I'm not sure which ones. And our final story for today, in terms of uh, building bigger dreams, is Iman Slaux. Uh, who knows who Iman Slaux is? Awesome. There's one person who knows who that is. So <coughs> this is the most remarkable thing. So Iman Slaux is a, a professor, and he's a professor in Ottawa. And uh, around uh, 1994, he had a whole different vision of what it would be due to do clinical blood chemistry at, uh, in a point of care setting uh, using disposable cartridges. Nobody believed his story. It was kind of ridiculous. Microfluidics, nobody really knew what that was. Uh, but he persevered. He managed to raise money in dribs and drabs, put all his heart and soul into this company. And uh, finally, in uh, 2000, or in actually 1999, he left the company. Uh, and in 2004, it was sold to Abbott. And that, that company was called iStat. And it's a gigantic division of Abbott right now. They built, a, I think, 400,000 square foot factory in Ottawa just to build the, the cartridges. Um, the division is headquartered out of New Jersey. And that transaction was for uh, about $400 million-ish. And, uh, and I was reading in the Ottawa, Ottawa newspaper that he actually ended up with about $3 million out of that whole transaction. So he did a fantastic job of inventing a new industry and commercializing it, and then, you know, through the ups and downs of capital and getting crunched on, uh, on liquidation preferences and whatever, he didn't get a lot of money out of it. So he was frustrated, but he still had another company in him. So he created and he, he, he reinvented it again. 
uh, and create a company called Epocal, um, which uh, made, made the devices much simpler and cheaper to make and so on. And that company was sold for $250 million. In fact, he's still there. Um, that's now owned by Siemens. So he's created two large successful clinical chemistry companies in the Ottawa area. And so what's interesting is so, uh, that these guys have all created hundreds of millions of dollars of value. And they've all created companies that have stuck and become uh, centers of, of their own industry in all these different centers around, around Canada. Um, none of them stayed as a homegrown company. Uh, I mean, they're all homegrown in some sense, but they're not owned locally anymore. And, uh, uh, and they all stuck, and none of them are in Toronto, which is, I think, a, a shame, and I think we have to fix that. So, uh, because there's this, this incredible uh, confluence of, uh, of talent here and, and clinical infrastructure and with Mars and Obio and all this sort of critical mass that's developing here, I have no doubt that when we look back in another decade, there will be five or ten companies of a similar stature that are, have grown here. Half of them will have sold to multinationals. The other half will be here as anchor tenants in the industry. And that's really, I think, the dream that, uh, that we have. So here's some of the other companies that have been prominent in uh, uh, Angiotech and QLT. Uh, Angiotech was the inventor of the drug-eluting stent that actually Boston Psy uh, was the one who, who actually commercialized it. But Angiotech was in the background, actually, with all the technology. It was very successful as a public company for a time. Um, here's some other uh, significant transactions. DSM MedTech, Excel Tech, I think, uh, which is now Natus company. Ultrasonics, which was sold to Analogic. Uh, Visual Sonics, which is now Fuji. Uh, Resonant in Montreal, I forget who bought them. Soren, uh, which started off as a company called Mitroflow in Heart Valves uh, in Vancouver. And Sidara. Um, so. I think, so here's, here's some other uh, Canadian med techs that, that are worth over $100 million right now. That, uh, you, and I, I bet you you don't actually know who all these guys are. So Titan Medical is a, is a quiet little pub co in Toronto, headquartered, but uh, they don't have a bunch of staff here. They're trying to basically go after intuitive surgical and do, uh, and, uh, do surgical robotics. Synaptive, I think most people know who that is, going after... after uh, brain surgery by and large. Uh, Cardium is trying to do atrial fibrillation catheter. They have, they have fantastic clinical results. Uh, they're raising money at about a $250 million valuation right now, pre-revenue. So that's, that's, that's what you can do when you go after a big clinical indication, right? Biolux, I guarantee nobody here has heard of Biolux. This is a small Vancouver company uh, going after accelerated orthodontics. Uh, Profound Medical, is, is, uh, is a local company, and Bayless, of course, is growing. That's going to become a wonderful uh, Toronto-based titan, and uh, Chris Shaw has done a fantastic job with that company. So it's kind of interesting that the numbers are still smallish, but uh, they will be much bigger. <coughs> and here's some up-and-coming stories uh, that I think, I'm not going to go through all these ones, and I, I imagine quite a few of you in the room are employed by some of these companies right now. Um, but I think there's a ton of exciting stories uh, all over different aspects of medical right now across Canada. <clears throat> I, won't, uh, I won't go through them all, although that's fun. That's what I love to do. But. <clears throat> so one of the things that I showed you last year was essentially I, I tried to map out last year <clears throat> what happened when a company like Sentinel Medical, for example, that sold to Hologic a few years ago, and there's not much operation, if any, of Sentinel left in Toronto. Um, but those people that learned how to do med tech at Sentinel, what happened to them next? And the answer is, they went to all over the industry. And uh, I think that's the critical ingredient of critical mass, really, is if a company goes down, are there places for those people to go? In Winnipeg, when a company goes down, and I, I track that as well, uh, you know, there's, most of the people end up going out of the industry if they want to stay in Winnipeg. But in Toronto, when you, when you, uh, when you, your company goes down, um, there's lots of places to go. And in fact, I was able to track that the, uh, the, the executives in Canadian MedTech right now, by and large, have learned how to be executives in MedTech from other Canadian MedTech companies, which is, 
a novel thing in the last 20 years because we've had we've had Medtronics and we've had strikers in town at in distribution, but we haven't had a bunch of uh, homegrown uh, companies with senior executives learning how to do marketing strategy and distribution and and uh, and regulatory compliance and and so on. So, so that's a good example. And I showed you this one, Visual Sonics. So exact imaging, for example, got a number of people out of Visual Sonics. In fact, licensed their core technology out of Visual Sonics. And that one's exploding into the market right now. Moleculite, um, Sentinel, et cetera. So that's, that's really uh, the legacy of those companies that, uh, that, that uh, move on. Cryocath, there's like 20 companies in there that uh, they're affecting to build the next generation. Uh, some of them corporates. QLT, which was a Vancouver, mostly pharma company. Blam, look at all that. About 50 or 60 different companies that those people are, are amplifying. So it's just one view into this critical mass question. Another, qu another way I looked at uh, this data I did a couple of years back for another talk, but it's basically a trajectory of uh, Canadian uh, patents relating to uh, med medical devices so over, over the course. Just this this dramatic uh, rocket ship of increasing, this is uh, granted US patents uh, in med tech. So by rocket ship, I mean 400, so that's not so many. But I'd love to see that number be more like 10,000. <clears> and I didn't track Canadian patents, mostly because if you're serious, you will file in Canada, but you will also file in the US. And so I wanted to uh, use U US as a proxy. <clears throat> and where is that innovation happening in Canada? It's, uh, and this again is simply by saying those co those companies that had assigned IP to another to a, the, the, the pa patents that were assigned to a, a Canadian entity, not patents by somebody that's held by themselves, assigned to a Canadian entity, uh, and and granted in the U.S. Where were those Where were those companies? And the answer is more than half of them were in Ontario. So I think that uh, that bodes well for the future of med tech right here. And number two was British Columbia, more than Quebec, which is interesting. So I'd like to uh, turn now briefly to uh, a study I did for a, a sort of informal study. You know, I always like to bring data to these things, right? And uh, so I looked at uh, trajectories of 50 um, serial medical device entrepreneurs all over North America, primarily American, and try to figure out what did they study, uh, how much intellectual property have they fired, what was their career trajectory? And then I'm going to show you what uh, comparing 28 entre uh, entrepreneurs some of whom are in the room in Canada, and uh, tell you about them. <clears throat> so what do they study? The answer is they're engineers. Is anybody surprised by this? <laughs> uh, so about 80% of them are engineers. These are serial, very successful serial med tech entrepreneurs. 80% are engineers. And, uh, and about 20% of them study business. But of course, they typically do an MBA once they realize that their career trajectory is going to be in business. Uh, and then about 20% are doctors, but half of those doctors are also engineers. I didn't show that in the data. There's some overlap in the, this particular data. I, you know, this is an informal study, but I think they, the, the trends are so big that they jump right out of the data. I'm not trying to do any fancy statistics here. So then I looked at what was their highest educational uh, degree? And the answer is, in this case, uh, about half of them finished with a bachelor's, and the other, and the other half do either a master's or a PhD. So that's, that's kind of interesting. You don't need an advanced degree to be a successful med tech entrepreneur. <clears throat> now this, I think, is probably the, one of the most illustrative ones, and, uh, and uh, this data is also mimicked in the Canadian data, that uh, how did they start their careers? Every university right now it seems like everybody, every single university has a new biomedical engineering program. It's one of those things. And they all have an entrepreneurship program as well, and they all tell all of their, their, their people to go start companies. And uh, that, that's, the, that's the thing. It's kind of a trendy thing. I'm delighted to have got old enough that all the stuff that I naturally like doing has become trendy. That's a, and um, so, so in this case, out of those 50 people that I studied, only seven of them, seven of them, or 15% or 14% uh, um, actually started their career by starting a company. So when I look at it, it's kind of remarkable because I know that there's more than that, that the, the, the data is higher than that for how many, uh, you know, how many people try to start a company. But these are successful people. 
So I think what we take from it is that people are successful at raising capital. People are successful at knowing that they have to get over themselves, that technology is cool and everything, but market need is more important. And having a company that actually works and has complementary people in it is also really important. And the engineering values that we all learn how to, that we all sort of value ourselves by how hard a problem we can solve uh, is actually the wrong approach when you're trying to be successful in business. <clears throat> so my, my general uh, advice to new grads is go get a job. <laughs> Don't forget that you're going to be an entrepreneur. That's your destiny. But go get a job now. Somebody else is going to teach you. They're actually going to pay you money to teach you all the stuff that you didn't even know you didn't know. And uh, that will make a big difference in your future career. <clears throat> uh, so I'm going to show you a bit about the Canadian entrepreneurs. So. Uh, I'm not going to go through all the names here. You probably recognize a few faces. I guarantee there's a few faces there you don't know. These are all uh, uh, significant Canadian medtech entrepreneurs, 28 of them. <clears throat> and I know a few of these people are also in the room. <clears throat> so what do they study? Over 90% of them are engineers. So uh, that's even more than the other, other data set I showed you. So, uh, so the very, very uh, technical group of entrepreneurs in medtech in Canada. And what's their highest degree? So there's a new category, which is technologist. That didn't exist in the American data. But uh, um, so there's a couple of, in the, there's only 28 people in this data set. So that's why it's a little bit uh, in, uh, in steps. But, uh, Basically all exactly identical, whether you do a bachelor's or a master's or a PhD. Remember the other data set was about twice as many bachelors. So Canadian medtech entrepreneurs are a little more educated than their American counterparts on average. Don't know what that means. Probably just means it's small numbers and statistics aren't that relevant. But <clears throat> ah, yes, that sort of teal segment or the, up in the top there, new co, 11%. That's the number of those 28 entrepreneurs that actually started their careers by doing their first entrepreneurial venture. So vanishingly small. So uh, that's still my advice. Based on this data and the other data, it, it, it basically corroborates the others that I was saying. Uh, t turns out those companies that do this for a living are, are, are uh, pretty good at it. And I added a new slide uh, for the Canadian data, which is how many years of career and this has been data of how many years of career until you started your first entrepreneurial venture. And the numbers range from zero to 35 years. And, uh, and in fact, the 35-year guy is a guy named Rocky Gansky running Solagis here in Toronto, which is a very interesting, uh, I think, qu quite exciting company, very, very clever the way they've, they've got, I think, around $20 million worth of free clinical data by uh, just the... He's just, just a very smart guy. And he got, he got smart by being a, a senior executive in medtech. And, uh, but the average is 12 years. That's the average number of years in Canadian medtech before people got enough confidence or enough skill or found the right opportunity before they started successful medtech. So the, you don't need to get uh, depressed that you're already two years out of school and your first venture is not really successful yet. <laughs> so that's the... Uh, that's the, uh, the, the, the sort of uh, the new data that I wanted to show you. I always like to give you a few numbers that are different from what I've shown you in the past. And uh, so, but the main premise of the show is really um, how do you build a successful company? How do you have the right dream? And I think, um, you know, it, it, Stan put it well. It's about the value proposition. It's about the IP. It's about a huge market, obvious value proposition. And it's about, I think it's about builders. If you look at those four stories that, uh, that I told you at the beginning, the people that started the company and got it rolling were not the same people that took it public or scaled it or built out the market. And uh, that's OK. You don't have to be everything. You just have to be fantastic at being you. And, uh, and, uh, but part of it is you have to have a big enough view of what it, what it is that you're going to take, take on. It's a pattern recognition game. How do, you, how do you go after a $100 million problem instead of a $10 million problem? The answer is you pick a $100 million problem. It's not that hard. 
I mean, it's hard to find it, but, it's, but you just keep looking until you find the right one. Just because you found an opportunity doesn't mean that's what you want to spend the next decade of your life's energy doing, right? And uh, I think that's, that's, if I was to say what, what is the objective that I had as visualizing this show originally was really that, how to help people pick the right thing to put their energy into. And uh, if you were here last year, you'll remember uh, Jeff Auchinleck was one of the speakers, uh, and, and he said, uh, as far as value proposition goes, he says, your opinion, although interesting, is irrelevant. That's, uh, and his, his basic point was, it's the, the same point we've heard today. Uh, go talk to 100 people. What they say is really what matters. It, 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 it's great that you're so smart that you have an opinion about all this, but, but that's, it's, it's, it, it's not really, you're, turns out you're not the one that's buying the product. And, uh, and we, we have an example of a client that we worked with in the past that launched their product with a value proposition and nobody bought it. Then they launched it ag again with a different value proposition and still nobody bought it. And then they launched it th yet a third time. Each time they have to raise capital into this company. And guess who's getting crunched on the cap table every time you do that? That, that means the, invest the original founder capital goes from 30% to 15% to 3% to, to 0% or 0.5%. They're living for their, for their uh, basically their management options after that, right? And uh, the investors only want to squeeze you so far before you lose interest in doing it at all, right? So that's, that's a, an interesting uh, situation. But they think they finally cracked that nut now, but uh, what if they cracked that nut six years ago instead? And uh, that, that, I guarantee that would have been a better outcome for all concerned. And uh, so I, I think, you know, I think we are punching a little under our weight here, but th I think that will change. I think that the community of people that support each other and help each and challenge each other to, to, p to pick the right things. And it's easy to live in an echo chamber and to tell each other stories about how smart everybody is and how great your company is going to do and so on. But you, what you really need is people telling you, that idea actually is sort of interesting, but go find another one. And uh, I think it's kind of a question of critical mass. I, I sort of, I like the sort of the fire metaphor, but another question is, you know, why is the movie industry in LA? And why is the uh, country, music in Nash country music industry in Nashville? Or why is it that most of the world's mining companies are headquartered in Toronto? You know, it's something like 60% of the entire world's mining industry is here. Within, uh, within, a, within a kilometer of this spot. So, and I'll bet you a lot of other places in the world say, how come we don't have any mining companies? What's wrong with us? And uh, the answer is that success begets success and, and you get specialists building up and, and people want to move there because they know they can, uh, they can find another job if that one doesn't work out and so on. So I, uh, I was at an Obio function on Thursday and I, I totally enjoyed uh, listening to Brian Bloom talking and. He talked about, uh, just down the hall here, there's this display, which is insulin as Toronto's gift to the world. Uh, and that's the desk of, of Banting, who uh, was the original researcher. That, and, uh, and he said, well, that is a gift. It, it, uh, but there was something wrong with that, because uh, there's two companies that have, have businesses that are approaching $20 billion each that sell insulin now, and none of them are in Canada. So how, how did that happen? It, that, uh, you know, the wonderful discovery, nobody had the foresight to realize that uh, it should be commercialized and built up rather than a university saying, hey, we could license that to somebody. So uh, I think that there's, there's plenty of horsepower here and there, I think the ability to create some amazing companies. You saw all that names of all those remarkable companies up and coming right now. And I'm hopeful that when I give a talk like this in five years here, that those slides will be, uh, they won't be actually be able to fit them on one slide anymore. So. Uh, our, our view from the, from, from the uh, starfish side is that it's about having dreams of, of companies. If you build a, a, if you go after the right value proposition, you should be able to have a $100 million value. And value, I think, in med tech companies is really a measure of clinical relevance. You cannot become relevant unless you're solving, or you cannot become valuable unless you're solving an important problem. That actually is, a, and the value proposition is well designed so it can be, get adopted. You don't spend 10 years like that chart showed of trying to, trying to figure out how to get your, your prostate surgery laser figured out because I don't know what's wrong with that, but for some reason nobody wants to do it. There's something wrong with that value proposition. So 
Uh, we've enunciated this at Starfish. Over the next decade, we want to have 100 of our clients become worth more than $100 million each. That's just a way to communicate partly inside our own staff that, uh, that we should be focused on the long-term value. It's not about designing the plastics a little better. It's not about um, you know, an incremental cost improvement. Those things are important, but the biggest thing is making sure that what we're designing is going to have a clinical impact. The value will be the right long-term thing. Don't get too fussed on the details until the deeply right thing shows itself. And so, and if we can do that, I'm sure together there's going to be a lot of success in the industry. So and that's my final comment. Thank you all for listening.